I'm Ashley. I'm Jen. And I'm Sarah. And we are Unabridged, the podcast where teachers take on books. Join us each week for bookish episodes and check out our website, unabridgedpod.com, where you can find lots of new bookish content every week. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod and message us there or see our website to get plugged into the Unabridged community. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hello and welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 197. Today's episode is about our September book club pick, Darcy Little Badger's Elatsue. Before we get started, I, we wanted to remind you that our website, www.unabridgedpod.com, has tons of content, lots of bookish content for you. Our blog has, on Mondays, we do curated lists. On Tuesdays, we do some pub day shout out so that you can see some new books that are releasing for the week and might you might be interested in. And on Fridays, we always publish a book review. We take turns so you get lots of different variety between Jen, Ashley, and myself. So we definitely would love for you to check out our blog, subscribe. It's very easy so that you can you won't miss any of the bookish content that we're putting out. Before we get started with our conversation about Alatsue, we wanted to start with our bookish check-in. Jen, what are you reading? So I am reading a memoir. I'm actually listening to it on audio and it is read by the author. Yay. This is Nadia. I know. I know. <laughs> it's my favorite. It. <laughs> uh, this is Nadia Awusu's Aftershocks. And wow, it is really, really brilliant. So Nadia is narrating this as an adult. A lot of it takes place in her childhood, but it is not chronological. It's sort of weaving through these different things that she's been through in her life. It is beautifully written. I'm loving the audio because it is read by the author, but I'm wanting the book because there are so many quotations I have wanted to highlight. And she has these sections throughout that examine the different parts of earthquakes and very poetically describes them. And then she'll relate like the aftershocks or the fault line to things in her life. And so it's this beautiful extended metaphor that runs through the book. The key part of it for me is her relationship with her parents and the way that has affected her. So her father was from Ghana and her mother was from, well, she was Armenian. She was raised in the United States, but the, our, her Armenian heritage was a very big part of her life. They were divorced when Nadia was quite young and Nadia and Yasmin for a while lived with her father's sister in London. She has also lived in Rome. She lives in an innumerable number of places. And she talks about the way that moving between all of those places, she's very adept at languages and the way that that has affected her as well and how she was trying to figure out what her true voice was and the way she sort of sees each new language as reflecting a new side of her personality. So when she was 13, she lived with her father, her stepmother, Annabelle, and then her younger siblings, her sister, Yasmin, and then she has a, a half brother as well. And her father dies of cancer. Her mother basically just doesn't want to take her in. She just abandons her. And her relationship with Annabelle has been tempestuous. And there's one part where Annabelle locks her out of her apartment or where she'll ban her from eating food from the refrigerator or the cabinet as a punishment for something that Nadia has done. I don't think it's too harsh to call it abuse. I see it as an abusive relationship, but also as the only stable person that Nadia has in her life. And so you definitely see, I mean, the title of the book is The Aftershocks. You see the aftershocks of this loss of her father, the loss of her mother, and then this really difficult relationship with her stepmother that that has had on her all through her teenage years and into her adulthood. It is really powerful. It is really sad. There have been parts that have been really difficult to listen to. There are other things that she goes through. She talks about the history of each of her cultures that she came from and the way that has impacted her parents and then her as well, that that's a part of her story. It, it is beautiful. And I'm really, I'm doing this as a buddy read with read with Tony. I'm really looking forward to the conversation because there's a lot to dig into, 
But yeah, just go in knowing that it is a difficult read, even though it is a powerful and beautiful one. Wow. That sounds really powerful. I think you would love it. I think you just have to, it's one that you shouldn't pick up. You got to be just on any day. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ashley, what are you reading? So one of the ones I'm reading right now is Jennifer Saint's Ariadne. I have seen a lot of really great things about this book. And so I really had wanted to dive into it. What really caught my attention about it is that it's compared to Madeline Miller's work. So she wrote The Song of Achilles and also Circe. And those are two of my most favorite books. So I was eager to try this one particularly for that. And it also fit in nicely. It takes place on an island and one of my uncorked reading challenge challenge Mm -hmm. categories (laughs) is for an island. I am woefully behind, but still determined to read a book for each month. And so that was a good fit for that. So it was another reason I started and it has been great. I am listening to this one on audio and I am captivated by the story. So It's something that I I only know a little bit about the mythology of it, so it's hard for me to know how much the story is deviating from the original mythology and how much it parallels. I will definitely be interested to compare that once I finish the story, but I'd rather, you know, not dive too deeply and hit spoilers. So what I have seen so far is that Ariane and her sister Phaedra are in a lot of ways really alone on the island of Crete. They're both princesses. They are the daughters of King Minos, and he is a calculating, cruel, generally completely self-absorbed king. All the mythology leads to the Minotaur, which a lot of people are somewhat familiar with, probably. So Minos had got cursed by the gods, basically, and so then because of that, his wife was driven to lust after a beast and that led to her birthing the minotaur so the minotaur is ariadne's half brother and she remembers him when he was like tiny and you know sees him in somewhat of a human way but he is a beast and they build the labyrinth to contain him and he is terrifying and so A lot of the story in the beginning is just the sense that you have of Ariadne's place in Crete and how powerless she is and how she's in a lot of ways just a pawn for her father and she's kind of awaiting what is going to be determined as far as marriage and things like that. Her mom, who birthed the Minotaur, never recovered from a lot of the trauma that led to her having him. And so in a lot of ways, Phaedra and Ariadne are really alone in their experiences. Their mom is not like mentally present for a lot of what's going on and they feel very isolated. And then you find out that once a year, there is a mass sacrifice that takes place for it's a ritual for the Minotaur and there's a whole ceremony around it and they bring in captives from other communities and then they lead them to slaughter basically. And so as the story is opening, you're seeing that day coming and the ways that both Ariane and Phaedra deal with this reality of where they live. And along comes Theseus who is a prince of a neighboring place, and he is unexpectedly one of the captives. And so the story unfurls from there. So he has purposefully gone with the other captives from his community and has a plan, you know, that he wants to enact. And meanwhile, King Minos has to navigate that and figure out how to deal with the power play there. So there's a lot of I love the mythology. I love seeing everything through Ariadne's eyes, and I am really captivated by the story. I think it's beautifully woven. Again, I'm, I'd be interested to know how much of it is a retelling of exactly how the myth originally was and how much of it is the creation of Jennifer Saint. But I'm absolutely loving it. It's been great so far. So again, that's Ariadne and is by Jennifer Saint. That's you know that nice. one's on my list. I love a retelling. 
Yes. I was surprised. I, I didn't think either of you had read it and I was surprised. I haven't read Circe either. And I've heard both of you rave about that, but golly, Ashley, that one sounds really fascinating and compelling. Yeah, it, it is. And it also has been great to do on audio. I think I would enjoy reading it, but I will say that as much as I loved Circe and I loved it, it actually took me a long time to work my way through it, especially the first half of the book. And I haven't found that with this, but it's similarly complex. And so I wonder if the listening is really helping with my momentum. But yeah, it's it's great. It's a great story. And just a really interesting, I mean, like Circe and some of the other retellings, it's a really interesting examination of the role of women in the time and how they how they saw themselves or could have seen themselves in this larger setting where the men's stories are what dominates. And so that's all really fascinating too. Yeah, that sounds great. What about you, Sarah? What are you reading? I am reading a book for my in real life book club. I'm reading Good Company. It's by Cynthia Dieprick Sweeney. And I I'm loving it. It is an examination of marriage and relationships and being a parent. The book centers around these two couples who have been friends for a really long time. They had been involved in this theater company called Good Company for part of their lives. Most of them are either actors or acting adjacent. One is a surgeon. One of the men is a surgeon, but it really explores how we love each other, but we can hurt each other. And I just am finding it really interesting examination of relationships. It is not super plot driven. I feel like it's more of a character study, but I mean, there is plot, but, and there are things that you're working toward, but it's really funny because in my book club, the past couple books that we've read, I have thought they were okay. And this one I am just loving, but I'm finding that (laughs) I'm opposite of most members of the, the book club. They are not liking this one as much, but I just think it's great. I think at where I am right now in my life, I really appreciate the examination of how hard life can be sometimes and how much even though we love each other, we sometimes hurt each other. And even though we might love being parents and and partners and all of that, that sometimes it's just hard and that you have to figure out how you make it through those things. And I, I mean, it might be the right book at the right time, but I just am really enjoying the complex relationships and the love that is the underlying, the relationship between these two couples. And I'm, I just really think it's great. So I'm excited to see how it ends. But like, I think the ride, I think this is one where the journey is going to be as fulfilling as the destination. So I'm just really liking it. And I think, and it's great on audio. I, I actually was able to get it from my library on audio. I have the hard copy book, but I, I got it on audio and it's just, it's really great. So that is Good Company by Cynthia Dieprick Sweeney. That sounds so good. Did you read her book, The Nest? No, I didn't. I mean, I've seen that everywhere. So now that I've, I don't know why yeah. I just haven't, I didn't haven't picked that up. But now that I've read Good Comp or that I'll have read Good Company, I think I might pick that one up too. Mm-hmm. Because I just I like, like her that expo- one. Her exploration of relationships is really interesting. Hello everyone, Sarah here. I am hopping on before our Alatsue discussion to quickly talk to you about a children's book that we received from Macmillan Kids. So thanks to them for sending this to us that we just loved. We didn't have it when we recorded the episode, but we wanted to let you know it just came out in mid-September and we wanted to let you know about it so that it could be on your radar. This book is called Nikki. Nakayama, A Chef's Tale in 13 Bites. It's by Jamie Michalak and Debbie Michiko Florence. The illustrator is Yuko Jones. This book is about Nikki Nakayama. She is a well-known chef. When she was little, she knew she wanted to be a chef, but she was discouraged by both society and her family. But she persisted and she became a very well-known chef and very successful in her career. And it's just a wonderful story about a young girl who faces a lot of adversity in 
following her dreams, but she does follow them and it works out for her. And it's just, the illustrations are great. And this is just a wonderful book for empowering young women and young people and seeing what you can accomplish when you really stick to what your dream is. And it's just a great, great kids book. So we highly recommend you check it out. Again, that is Nikki Nakayama, A Chef's Tale in 13 Bites by Jamie Michalak, Debbie Machiko Florence, and then the illustrator is Hugo Jones. So definitely check that out. All right, so now we are on to our main segment. We are going to be dis- discussing Darcy Little Badger's Alatsaway. Before we get started, I'm just going to read a synopsis that's from the publisher because everybody knows how terrible I am at summaries. So I just <laughs> got it from the publisher because they know best, I guess. <laughs> so here's a synopsis Alatsaway. Ellie, for short, lives in an alternate contemporary America shaped by the ancestral magics and knowledge knowledge of its indigenous and immigrant groups. She can raise the spirits of the dead of dead animals, most importantly, her ghost dog Kirby. When her beloved cousin dies, all signs point to a car crash, but his ghost tells her otherwise. He was murdered. Who killed him and how did he die? With the help of her family, her best friend Jay, and the memory of her great, 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 great great grandmother lats away <laughs> that's six greats lats away must track down the killer and unravel the mystery of this creepy town and its dark past but will the nefarious townsfolk and a mysterious doctor stop her before she gets started Ooh. <laughs> sounds <laughs> creepy <laughs> so that's the the summary of lats away we are going to talk about it as we always do with a few different points and then we are going to give our bookish hearts at the end and our pairings. So first of all is overall impressions. Ashley, what were your overall impressions? So I really enjoyed this one. It wasn't what I expected. I did know that there would be some magical elements. I kind of remember Jen saying a long time ago about her pet dog, Kirby, and that he is this ghost dog and So I remembered a little bit about that and was interested in that part, but I didn't expect it to be as much in the realm of the paranormal as it is. I think this is, if you haven't read yet and you're listening, this is a great mood read for October and a lot of fun and atmospheric in that way. I thought that what worked really well for me was the connection that Alasawe has to her heritage and to her past. And the ways that that gives her strength in her present. I thought all of that was really lovely. And I also really liked her relationship with Jay. I liked her relationship with her parents. So there were a lot of things as far as the community relationships and the connections to each other that I thought were really fascinating. And I did absolutely love Alatsuwe's connection with her dog Kirby. So he is a dog who was her pet in real life and who is now her ghost pet. And I found all of that, the the connection between them and the way that that gave her power, but also protection. I thought all that was really beautiful. Jen, how about you? What were your overall impressions? Yeah, I really love this. This was a reread for me. I originally read it as a buddy read with the Mama's Book Club. And yeah, the I, the cover, I think, gives a very different feel. And of course, we should not judge books by their cover, blah, blah, blah. But the cover gives a very different feel of the book than I think the book ends up being. And I do remember that the way it started, where it launches you into this modern world, and immediately you figure out that there's Kirby and that there are vampires. And yeah, was interesting. And then this time I reread it on audio, which I thought was great, by the way. And I I was prepared for that. So I was much more focused on the interesting way that Darcy Little Badger takes the speculative fiction elements of the book and yeah, the fantasy elements of the book and then connects them with Alatsaway's past and her heritage and that sense of story and that stories are important and that regardless of how true to life they are, there is truth in them. And I think that's really interesting when you throw in the vampires and then I won't do the spoiler yet, but what we ultimately find out is behind her 
cousin's death. And I think all of that is really woven together. So in, in such an interesting way, I think it's a really innovative book. And yeah, so I really love that. I, I know we're going to do what worked for us next. So I'm saving one thing, but yeah, I, I really loved it both times. And I liked trying it in the different formats because I think that reinforced different parts of the story for me. So yeah. How about you, Sarah? So like Ashley said, I was totally surprised at what the actual story of Alaska Way was when I looked at the cover and just from what I'd heard about it, I was not expecting so much fantasy or magical elements in it. I really loved Kirby. <laughs> I really loved him. And her, I loved her ghost dog and that connection she had with them. I thought a lot of the relationships were really strong and I loved learning about them. There were a few things that took me out of the story a little bit. I think because I wasn't expecting that like supernatural element when the vampires started being talked about I felt a little discombobulated I didn't realize that we were I knew that Ellie had a connection to her native roots and I knew she had a connection to spirits and that all seemed very what I was expecting but then the magic and the fairies and the vampires uh <laughs> I did get a little unmoored when that started happening because I wasn't expecting it. Overall, I thought the story was really compelling. And I think that YA readers will really enjoy it. So I think that we talked about this a little bit, but what worked for you, Jen? What was something that worked for you in the story? I kind of like the fact that this was jarring. The The sense that we are in such a thoroughly modern world where Ellie is having to deal with modernity and her parents telling her stories about driving and the fact that her best friend needs this constant reassurance and it incorporates the fact that she's asexual and things that would not necessarily appear in a lot of older literature with the fact that at the center of the story are these older stories and that layering of that modernity and that modern awareness and, you know, when Ellie's having to deal with everyday racism. And I just thought it was really an interesting juxtaposition of those two worlds. And I've read a lot of literature from indigenous authors, but I've never read anything quite like this, where that heritage and culture is paired with the vampires and the, yeah, the fairies. Like I thought it was so great that Jay was part fairy, but <laughs> he only has a little bit of the power. And it, it gave me the feel of, I don't know if either of you watched True Blood on HBO or have read those books, the Sookie Stackhouse book. Yeah. But it parts of it felt like that where you're in this magical world with all of these magical creatures. And also here's all of this other just really everyday stuff that people that t that teenagers today have to deal with. So, so I really liked that all of that was woven together. And I sort of liked that it felt a little uncomfortable and unexpected, but then it just became a merit of the story for me. Yeah, I thought those connections were really interesting too, Jen. Ashley, what is something that worked for you? So I think one of the things I loved the most was, and Jen kind of touched on this with comments about the racism that Ellie faces and also the ways that she's exploring her lip and Apache heritage. But I think the thing that really worked the best for me was the exploration of her native culture. And so I loved all of the, I loved the part about the Lip and Apache land and the way that she could use that power to banish people from that space. I thought that was really fascinating. And I loved how, I mean, kind of what Jen was saying about looking at the speculative fiction part, but then tying it to historical fiction and to really looking at, yes, that was, that, that land belonged to to that community and what does it mean if there are trespassers on that land i thought all of that worked really well so i think that was the part i loved the best particularly i loved the stories of her sixth great grandmother and the ways that that 
understanding of her heritage and her lineage, her legacy, like how that shaped her understanding of herself. I loved that especially, but in general, I liked how Ellie's understanding of herself and her space in the world was connected so strongly to her roots. And I thought all of that worked so nicely and just in a really fascinating way in this like really speculative novel where all these like really outlandish things also are happening. So yeah, I think that was the thing that worked best for me. Yeah. I like that too. What about you, Sarah? What was something that worked for you? I mean, I think I have to reiterate what you said. I think the respect that Ellie had for her, like you said, her heritage, but also just the overall respect for the Lipin Apache history and the way in which she wanted to explore that and she felt so connected to her roots. I found all of that really fascinating. And I really liked the connection to the dead. Like I really like that when someone is gone, they still feel this connection and the beautiful way they commemorate people that they've lost and the whole burial ritual and all that stuff. I just found it all very comforting in the way that her family came together and how they respected each other. They respected their elders and they respected their history. And I just thought that was really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I loved that too. And I thought that like, even things like not being able to say the name of the dead, like the reasoning behind that made it so beautiful instead of seeming like it was a turning away. It's instead a recognition of the, you know, how sacred the life is. And so I thought all of that, I really loved that too. Okay. Now we're each going to share a quote that we really loved from the book. Ashley, do you want to start us off? Sure. So like I said, I really loved the aspects of the sixth great grandmother. I thought that all of that was really beautiful in this story. And so the quote I wanted to share relates to that. So in the beginning, just to give context, it is Vivian. It's Ellie's mom who's talking here. And she's talking about the sixth great grandmother who was also named Alatsaway. And she says, she knew herself and never doubted what she knew. No matter how many times people said, it's too dangerous, don't do it. Your sixth great grandmother knew that she was capable of wonderful, dangerous things. That isn't a flaw, it's enviable. She took a risk for love. That isn't a mistake, it isn't even a bad decision. And I thought that that passage was so powerful because first of all, we see in, throughout the book the way that Vivian is in opposition to both Alatsue, like Ellie Alatsue, her philosophy on a lot of things, and also her her the ways that Vivian is in opposition to the sixth great grandmother. And while she's willing to use her power, she uses it in a much more reluctant way. And Yet in this moment, she is acknowledging that perhaps she was wrong in some of her view of all of the choices that the sixth great grandmother had made and that she's coming to understand that maybe there's a different way of seeing those stories and seeing the choice that she made. And even the the choice that we ultimately find out that the sixth great grandmother made that led to her not being able to return to the world, essentially, that even in that moment, there's this feeling that Vivian, after everything that happens with the town and with Trevor and with Ellie's ability to help in what could have been a much more disastrous situation, she's recognizing that perhaps her understanding that she'd always had was wrong. And maybe there's another way to see it. And I think all that's really rich. So I absolutely loved that passage. And I loved more generally the conversation that Ellie has with her parents after the encounter is over. Yeah, I love that. It's beautiful. Jen, what is your quote? Yeah, so mine actually takes place right after the one Ashley just read. But this is, she's talking, Ellie is talking to the coyote and says that she's going to tell her story. I guess I should start from the beginning. When I was a kid, my parents took me to the pound. That's where I met a dog. She'd say his name and tell his story. Maybe someday he'd follow the words home. And I think what I love about that one is what it represents in the story, which is Ellie taking her place in this narrative that has continued from sixth grade. And that, yeah, just, I I mean, I just love that whole section of just 
it's finally coming together for her. And Ellie is so smart and things have been so together for her throughout. But I sort of see that as a step up in her acknowledgement of who she is and of what's important and of her place in her family history. So I love that. And of course, anything with Kirby makes me happy. I love, I mean, who doesn't want their relationship with their favorite pet to continue past its death? And I think that is so, it's so easy to connect to that. I think that's a great anchor point in the book for me. Yeah. How about you, Sarah? What's a quote that you want to explore? Mine is pretty simple and to the point, but it is about Ellie's feelings surrounding Trevor's death and her connection to the afterlife. And the quote is maybe sometimes wants felt like needs because the alternative hurt too bad. And to me, that was just so powerful. And it's funny, I when I was listening to the book, and when she said that, it just like pierced my heart when when that was read. And so I knew that was going to be my quote, because I just to me, it is such a simple thing, but to me, it resonates when you lose someone sometimes, even though what you want might not be the best thing, but sometimes it feels like a need because the hurt and the, the pain is just so great. And I just thought that was really a beautiful way to express that sentiment. Yeah. yeah, I thought all of that with Lenore that we see mm-hmm. and the way that she will go to any length and is willing to do anything. I thought that was really powerful. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think when you think about Lenore and when she is speak, talking about the last thing that she said to Trevor before he left and then the desperation and that she felt knowing that. Ellie had this connection to the afterlife and that even though she knew the consequences of trying to bring back a human or like have that connection with someone in the afterlife, she was willing to risk it. And when Ellie said that, I mean, you know, it just, it just hurt me in my chest, you know, for Lenore and what she was going through and the desperation that I feel like a lot of people would feel in that situation. Yeah. 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 Okay. So We are going to go ahead and move on. I feel like there is so much we could say about this book and a lot that we could discuss, but we don't want to have a 10 hour episode. (laughs) (laughs) So we are going to move on to our pairings. Jen, what is your pairing for this book? So I had a few options and I'm hesitating to go with this one because I've talked about it on the podcast so much, but I really think it's a good pairing. And that is Aiden Thomas's Cemetery Boys. I think the connections I see are both are YA books. Both deal with characters who every day are seeing the evidence of the importance of their family and their history and their culture. And there are super natural elements to both. They are quite different. So Cemetery Boys doesn't have the vampires and the fairies and that whole component, but they both have this sense of a world where the dead can always be with us, where their spirits can always be with us, but that they are definitely changed. And I think Yadria, like Ellie, is such a strong character, but they are both very much still in the process of figuring out all of the facets of their identity. And yeah, so I just think if you liked A Lats Away, I think that Cemetery Boys would be a great next read because there are so many commonalities, even though ultimately I think the styles and the tones are quite different. I think there are a lot of things that make them a great pairing. I think that's a good one. Ashley, what is your choice for your pairing? So several came to mind for me as well, but the one I want to recommend is Angeline Bouley's Firekeeper's Daughter. We've talked about this one a little bit. This came out not so long ago and was just a really phenomenal release when it came out. And this one is also young adult. And there are a lot of things that connected, but the main thing that really stood out to me is that in both cases, there's a bit of a central mystery that is being uncovered. And there's a lot of nefarious forces at work that are helping to keep that mystery hidden. And so I feel like that part really is what brought this to mind. Donna Fontaine is the main character and she is of the Ojibwe tribe. So it is a different native heritage, but she is 
similarly deeply rooted in her native heritage and in her connection to the Ojibwe community. So she is actually an unenrolled tribal member and she is part native. And so a lot of that is explored, like what it means to be an unenrolled member, why it's important to be enrolled in a tribe, what impact that has on her life. And like Jen said before, I think that Angeline Bully also explores the idea of what it means to be a native teen in today's world. And so we really see that exploration in this book as well of just what does that mean for Donna Fontaine? How does it impact her daily life? What experiences does she have? How is she treated sometimes differently? Or how does she experience racism? I think we see a lot of those points explored. But then, like I said, the other thing is that at the center, she has lost someone that she loves. It also is in a very mysterious situation or what she believes to be one. It's something that similar to Trevor and the car accident. It's something that people believe that they know exactly what happened. But over time with her experiences, she comes to realize that perhaps things are not what they seem. And so I think that that thread of unpacking the mystery and of a teen who is willing to go the distance, who will do what it takes in order to get to the root of the problem. We really see that in Donna Fontaine also. She is also a really courageous character who is willing to do whatever it takes. And so I love, I think I admire Alatsui character and Donna Fontaine's character in a similar way. So I feel like that one doesn't have anywhere near as many of the fantastical elements as far as speculative fiction, but I do think at the core story, there's a lot of similarities. So again, that's that's Angeline Boley's Firekeeper's Daughter, and it is a great book. Oh, that's still my TBR, and I just keep seeing it, and I just want to read it so badly. I just haven't gotten to it, but gosh, every time you all talk about it, I just <laughs> I just know that I want to read it so badly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll love it. What about you, Sarah? What's your pairing? Well, like you, Jen, I hesitated to talk about this one because I feel like I've talked about it several times on the podcast. But when I was thinking about Lats Away, to me, I thought about Danielle Clayton's The Bells. For one thing, this story centers on Camilla Beauregard, who is the strong female character who is really fighting for her family, which are the other Bells, and what she believes is right. And I feel like she has that connection to Ellie. And then the other thing that really stood out to me was the way, so this is a fantasy book and I felt like Letaway had a lot of social commentary on racism and class. And I think it, Danielle Clayton does a really good job just as, as Darcy Little Badger does in a Letaway. I thought Dan, Danielle Clayton did a really good job of making this book very accessible, but also making some very strong statements about racism and class within the fantasy world of the Bells, which I think was also present in Alats Away. So I thought when I was reading Alats Away, I thought about the Bells and I felt like that's why I had to speak on that. And as you all know, I love this book. I love the Bells. And I so I wanted to talk about it one more time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think those connections make a lot of sense. I think it's like our three books took different facets of a lots away. So yes. there you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> three different, very different pairings, but uh, yes. yeah. Okay. So let's end our discussion with bookish hearts. Jen, what number of bookish hearts are you going to give a lots away? This one is a four and a half for me. Okay. Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> this was a solid four for me. What about you, Sarah? So for me, this was a three, which it does not, it's not a commentary on the content. It just, I felt a little unmoored in the story, but I ultimately thought that it's a good read. But for me, it was three bookish hearts. So now we're going to end with our give me one and our give me one comes from one of our ambassadors, Amy, and it is a clothing store where you like to shop. Jen, what is your choice? 
So I'm going to cheat a little bit. So the store is loft just because it's one of those stores, like, you know, the stores where you know your size, you know, it's going to fit you, you know, the style is going to work for you. But I also want to shout out Stitch Fix because it's been a while since I talked for them. And that is not a store that's a subscription service, but it is so much fun. And I do get a lot of my clothes from Stitch Fix. And yeah, I've had a lot of success with them. So the store is loft, but I also recommend Stitch Fix. I like Stitch Fix too. It's so much fun. <laughs> Ashley, what's yours? So this is something I might have shared some, but I have really struggled with this since I moved to Virginia. The Limited was my store, and that is where I bought all my professional clothes. And then I did not have easy access when I moved and didn't love shopping online. And then they had a lot of bankruptcy and transformation and stuff. So since then, I feel like I haven't had the same anchoring that I had earlier on in my career as far as like my go-to for professional clothes. So I am still on the lookout and would be happy to take recommendations. I have thought about trying Stitch Fix. I had some luck with doing one of those kind of mix and match boxes from Thread Up. So I'll probably try that again. But a store that I wanted to mention that I plan to shop at when I get back to the States and back to Virginia is Charlie Rose Boutique. That is one of our downtown stores. And I just really admire their social media presence. I think that so their handle is shop Charlie Rose. And you can order online also for people who are listening outside of Virginia. But I just love the owner. I love her. She's very body positive and affirming and really just it's seeing her social media presence that's made me want to shop at the store. So I haven't done much shopping there yet, but I love what I see online. And that is a place that I'm planning to check out because I will definitely need to be freshening up my wardrobe when we when we get back home. <laughs> I will be saying goodbye to pretty much everything I brought because it has had a lot of wear and tear and it'll be time to freshen up. And so that's one that I'm excited to try when I get home. And again, that's Charlie Rose Boutique is the name of the store. What about you, Sarah? What's one for you? Oh, I was so excited that Amy gave us this topic because I've really tried to make a conscious decision to either try to purchase from thread up so that it's like uh, the that clothes are getting more use because I, I read that book, The Conscious Closet, and that really made me feel really bad about my fast fashion consumption. So I've either been trying to do that or buy local and shop small. And in my town, we I live in a tiny little town and we have this amazing shop in our town that is doing an amazing things. So Christy is the owner of the shop. She and her mom and dad are in there a lot. And it is a clothing and gift shop. They have sizes small to 3XL. So they have extended sizes and she does an amazing job of getting really cute things. And she's got, a, like you said, Ashley, Christy has an amazing social media presence. She does live at five on Mondays and Fridays. And she shows some of the stuff that she has in the shop. She, they don't have a huge website where you can purchase, but you can purchase from the lives and tell people, and she does ship. So I have just been amazed that my little town has this amazing shop. I, I, I go in every time she gets a new shipment because I just love, actually, I'm getting ready. To, after we record, I'm going out with my mom and my grandmother for lunch and I have on a dress I got there. So I have bought a ton of stuff. And so the shop is called The Buttercup. Her social media handle on Instagram is the Buttercup 2020. And then she, like I said, does a ton of stuff on Facebook, but I love the shop and I love that it's local. And I have really not bought any clothing for myself that has not been either from a secondhand shop or from a local shop for quite some time. So I'm really happy about that. And I just, I really would love everybody to support the Buttercup because I think that she is doing amazing things and they're just so welcoming and they remember who you are and your name. And it's just an amazing experience. So I love the buttercup in this tiny little town in Newmarket, Virginia. That's awesome, That's Sarah. Awesome. <laughs> right. I know. I can't wait to you, check that one out. So you guys should definitely come and check it out because I think you'll love it. That she does, she does a great job of curating really amazing things. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we hope that you have enjoyed our discussion on Elect Away. We would love for you to, to join in our discussion as we discuss it during September. And just a reminder to check out our website and our blog at www.unabridgedpod.com and be on the lookout on Monday for our Give Me One post so that you can share a clothing store that you love to shop at. We would love to hear that. We're always looking for new places to shop. Thanks for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or on the web at unabridgedpod.com for ways to support us. To get more involved, you can sign up for our newsletter, join a buddy read, or become an ambassador. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.